First of all, everybody knows what an electron is. That's the component of an atom, which is the valence electrons, for example, determine the chemistry of, of an atom. A positron is the antiparticle of an electron. So it has, instead of a negative charge as an electron has, it has a positive charge. Well, it turns out that if you get an electron and positron close to each other, they don't like each other, so they annihilate. And in fact, there was a faculty member here at MIT named Martin Deutsch, who was the first to study electron-positron annihilation. It's an interesting story. But that was at low energy, what the experiments, early experiments at MIT were. What I would like to talk about is what happens when you have electrons annihilate with positrons at high energy. And that becomes a very interesting experimental platform. By high energy, I mean something like the energy would be on the order of 100 times the mass of the proton. So this is uh, quite an energetic uh, in annihilation. There is a particle that's called the Z boson, which is the particle that is responsible for the neutral current interaction in weak interactions. For example, in neutrino scattering, a neutrino can scatter off a quark by exchanging a Z boson, that is Z means zero charge neutral, um, versus a neutrino scattering off a quark with a W boson, which is a charge particle, and that's called charge current interactions as a neutrino scattering. Well, E plus E minus, of course, starts out with a zero charge in its initial state. The electron charge is exactly matched by the positron charge on the other side. The negative is exactly the same in magnitude as the, ch as the positive. So they can only annihilate into a neutral object. And if you have enough energy, namely on the order of 100 times the mass of the proton, they can annihilate into this Z boson. And this was really a tremendous thing to do because the electron-positron annihilation is experimentally very, very clean. That means that there is very little background. So an experimentalist, if you are lucky enough to make an accelerator with sufficient energy and a detector that works sufficiently reliably, if you can collide and annihilate electrons with positrons, you have this beautiful physics picture that unfolds in front of you. And that is you produce the Zs, and then you can study their decay characteristics. So the experiment I worked on was at the Stanford Linear Accelerator called SLAC. It was a, a, a wonderful opportunity for me to, to continue my interest in in what started in neutrino scattering, but then apply that in the context of electron-positron annihilation. So when you produce a, a Z boson, you study its decay. It can decay into electrons and positrons. So it's basically you annihilate electron-positron, you produce the Z, and then it decays back into electron-positron. But it only does that a few percent of the time. But the Z can also decay into some other things, such as um, a muon, a mu plus and a mu minus. Muons are, have every characteristic as a heavy electron. The only problem is that their mass is 100 or 200 times the mass of the electron, and they're unstable. But they live long enough so you can study them in the laboratory. So you can study electron-positron annihilation to a Z, now the Z decays into electron-positron, or the Z decays into a muon plus and a muon minus, or you can make, sometimes the Z will decay into different quark-antiquark -quark pairs. And that's one of the nice things about it. It's sort of universal. Once you produce a Z, it can decay into a pair and an antipair of any particles, so long as the mass is sufficiently low and the energy, conservation of energy, uh, rules apply. So a Z could decay into um, an up quark and an anti-up quark, which are the up quarks are constituents of a proton. It can decay into a down quark and an anti-down. Uh, it can decay into a charm quark, which is the next generation of quarks. It can decay into a, a bottom quark, which is uh, the companion, or it can 
change into a, a strange quark, um, but it cannot decay into a top quark because the top quark is much too massive. The top quark is 175 times the mass of the proton and therefore uh, the Z cannot decay into a top quark. It's a good laboratory to study these different decays and by looking at the uh, properties of the decays then you can determine various characteristics of, um, of the interaction, the weak interaction, the charge interaction. Um, you can study many aspects of the what's called the standard model which is the the model of quarks and and leptons and forces that we high energy physicists have been checking for the last 40 years the data from electron positron annihilation at the z pole uh, was able were able to address a number of important questions one of them was how many neutrinos are in the universe and that was one of the first things that experiments which produced uh, Zs at, from electron-positron annihilation were able to do. And it turns out that the Z boson actually has a, a finite width. Its, its mass is about 93 um, GeV, so it's about 94 or 95 times the mass of the proton but its mass is not just a single number. Its mass has a finite width and that's related to quantum mechanics. Um, the larger the width, the more readily the particle will decay. Well, by measuring the width of the Z, by scanning the energy of the electron-positron beams uh, which produce the, the Z, you can measure the width of, of, the, of the Z directly. And it turns out that the width is completely consistent with having only three neutrinos in the universe. So that is three neutrinos which are light, namely less massive than, than the mass of half of the, of the Z boson. And that was one of the first and most fundamental discoveries that were actually made in, in uh, electron-positron annihilation at the Z pole. It was absolutely fundamental. So it's, um, by having your little laboratory uh, in California or this big laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland, which did similar, quite um, simultaneous experiments, and using the, the grid and waterfalls to produce energy to, that makes an electron and positron beam, you can discover something about the universe, and that is that there are only three light neutrinos. And that was really one of the first and most fundamental discoveries of, of, uh, of electron-positron annihilation at the z-pole. Well, there were many, many other questions. Um, one of the, the early prospects of doing electron-positron annihilation at the z-pole was to discover um, other kinds of particles. It was originally thought that maybe there would be so-called supersymmetric particles. These are particles that uh, have not yet been detected, but they are particles which are sort of a mirror universe or a companion set of particles to the standard model particles that we know. So for example, an electron has a spin one half and a charge of, of uh, one unit, or minus one unit, but its supersymmetric companion is called a selectron, and it would have spin zero, um, but many of the same properties of the, of the electron. So it's a kind of mirror universe. And this was a theory that was proposed in the, in the late 1960s, maybe early 70s, it was developed, and um, experimenters have been trying to find evidence of supersymmetry in many different places, including the original ones in electron-positron annihilation at, um, at the Z-pole. There were other, other things, um, for example, testing the standard model. This was something which, uh, in my career, I was in college when the first papers were written about the standard model. These were in the early 60s. And then I was in graduate school when a lot of the papers were developed and then the standard model emerged. And I could say that my entire career has really been spent in trying to test the standard model. But what is 
underneath that is to try to find violations to the standard model, try to find experimentally things which are not predicted by the standard model. And so when the electron-positron annihilation experiments were first laid out, of course there were lots of um, interesting questions beyond the standard model that were asked. One of them was whether or not there are supersymmetric particles. Another one was whether or not there is a, another size, quarks, um, another fundamental size. For example, quarks um, exist, they're contained, they're experimentally quite verifiable. Um, on the other hand, they never uh, get out of their containment vessels. Their containment vessels are so strongly bound. For example, a proton is a containment vessel for three quarks. And it is, they're so tightly bound that if you try to pull it apart, the little pieces of gluons that hold it together break apart and they produce more particles and more particles and more particles. But you never get free quarks. But anyway, the thought is that in, initially in these experiments, there would be another size, another thing. The quarks would actually be composite particles, and they would in turn be made out of subquarks. And there was a lot of theory, at least among some people, and a lot of excitement that maybe you could discover subquarks in these experiments. Well, E plus E minus annihilation at the z-pole actually was a whole set of very nice experiments. They were very precise experiments, and they verified the standard model. They were able, because of the high statistics and the good detectors and the cleanliness of electron-positron scattering, they were able to measure many of the parameters of the standard model. For example, how, how a, a bottom quark couples to a, a Z boson, how, um, how a charm quark couples, etc. That the electron-positron measurements produce the most precise value of the Weinberg angle. They produce the most precise value of the, of the Z boson mass. And they continued at, at uh, the, the electron-positron collider at CERN above the z-pole, and they were actually with sufficient energy to make um, charge W pairs. So they were able to make a W plus, uh, which is the mediator of the charge current interaction with its companion antiparticle, the W minus. And by measuring the threshold uh, behavior, the energy behavior of, of how strongly the electron and positron annihilate to produce this W pair. They could actually measure the curve, and that curve was one of the very important measurements to show that um, how the W coupled to um, its particles to produce a finite interaction. The W, for example, E plus E minus can exchange a neutrino, it can exchange a gamma, or it can produce a Z zero, which then produces a W pair. And all of those three reactions worked beautifully in concert um, to produce the cross-section, followed theory beautifully. And that was one of the major confirmations of the standard model.